Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope this finds you happy, healthy, and well with a cup of coffee like me. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Soundcheck. Uh, today we're going to be sitting down with Bill Larkin and with our inimitable host, Dr. Greta Pope. Uh, but before we get started, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, for those that have not joined us for sound check before, welcome. Uh, this is our weekly space where we sit down and talk and we want to continue to have you in these spaces with us if you haven't joined them before. Um, if you don't follow us on social media, feel free to do so. You could get to us at Coffer Center on social media platforms. So that's at Coffer Center, easy enough. Um, or if you are more of an email person, go to our website, coffercenterchicago.com and head to the middle button at the bottom, the Coffer Headliner. Um, that is our newsletter that brings these types of events right to your inbox so you can RSVP and stay tuned for future conversations, workshops, seminars, and events like this. Um, so we would love to have you with us. So please stay engaged, stay in our communications, Stay tuned in so that we can stay tuned in with you. Um, I have been so grateful to Greta for having this series because I've said before, and I'll say again, one of my favorite things about our physical space is getting to sit down and see one another, connect with creatives and, and hear what people are up to, talk shop, um, and just connect and, and stay tuned in with one another. And that has been one of the harder things about this pandemic cycle is that we haven't been able to be in shared spaces, um, but I am full of gratitude to Greta for creating a space uh, that gives us an opportunity to connect in this way and to continue to create dialogue with one another. Um, so without further ado, I want to invite Dr. Greta Pope to the conversation. Greta, how are you this Friday morning? I know you are in Michigan. What is life like as a Michigander today? Well, it's very peaceful, very quiet, a little cloudy, but good, no complaints. How are you this morning, Jess? I am okay. I know you know I uh, I had five days of a migraine, um, oh and God. so you know I've said this in other spaces that I've been in this week on Zoom. I'm like, it's it it you get very grateful for the littlest things, right? So today I'm grateful to just have a normal morning where I haven't felt the need to take ibuprofen, and all I really needed to focus on is if I wanted a second cup of coffee or not. Like I'm like, this is. <laughs> This is sublime. So I, you know, I think I think the grateful the grateful side of having a migraine is that it makes you grateful for not having a migraine, and that in and of itself yeah. is a gift. So yes, that's where I am today. I understand. <laughs> grateful for the little things. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah. 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 Well, well as I as I expressed, I'm grateful to you. Thank you so much oh, for hosting this you. series with us. And without further ado, I will get out of your way so that you can take up the conversation from here. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Jess. Hey there, and welcome to Soundcheck. I'm Dr. Greta Pope, and I'm so excited to have this opportunity to visit with creatives from a variety of disciplines about their professional journey. We are in the midst of a pandemic that has changed all of our lives and the ways in which we work. We will use this forum to share our thoughts, feelings, and best practices for surviving this challenging time. Today, we have a wonderful, wonderful gentleman with us. I am so excited. Uh, he is a Chicago legend. His name is Bill Larkin. Bill Larkin is an award-winning stage actor, having received the Joseph Jefferson Award for Outstanding Performance by a lead actor in a musical for the role of Edward Kleban in Porchlight Music Theater's A Class Act. He is also an accomplished pianist, singer, and comedy songwriter. He has performed his original music uh, on Comedy Central's Premium Blend. Uh, his comedy album, Knowing Your Audience, was recorded live at the Green Mill Jazz Club in Chicago. He has also been a dueling pianist for the last 20 years. And I have recently learned that he did a very fun and exciting birthday greeting for Jess's son last year for his birthday. So very exciting. What a thrill it is to have Bill with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Larkin. Hi, Bill. Oh my goodness. Good morning, Dr. Pope. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's weird hearing my some of my credits back. I'm like, oh, yeah. 
Oh. Very, very impressive credits, Bill. Very oh. impressive. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome to Sound Check, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate so, it. You are a musician, an actor, a comedian. Wow. That's all I can say. I mean, you, you, you're doing so many exciting things. And I think the way that we're going to start off today, I see that you're in front of your keyboard. And we'd like to hear just a little, a little snippet of something so that our audience knows what kind of thing you're doing. Sure. Uh, let us see. What can I begin with? Um, here's a song, uh, some, somewhat of a, a recent song I, I wrote. Um, hey, Dan, my man, what's up? It's great to see you once again. I want to take this opportunity to say I'm glad we're friends. When we met at Lisa's party, I just knew we'd get along. We have so many common interests and our bond is super strong. We love to laugh, we love to drink, we party everywhere we go. I mean, I think it's really kind of cool, this friendship that we've been creating. So Dan, just let me say that you're my buddy. You're my bro. Oh, and by the way, I'm gay and we've been dating. <laughs> I love it. I can tell by your expression that this comes as news to you. I could have sworn when we were wrestling, you felt what I felt too. It's weird you didn't know. I mean, all the signs were there when I walked three steps behind you. I'm not looking at your hair. Honestly, I thought you knew when we watched sports at that bar and you turned to watch the Bulls game and I watched the figure skating. Well, it doesn't really matter. Things are going well so far. Only now you know I'm gay and we've been dating. That's just a little. I love it. I love it. Very clever. Very clever. So. Let's go back to the beginning. Where are you from and where did you grow up? Wow. Bedford, Massachusetts, which a lot of people think means New Bedford, but it is not. There's a regular, just run-of-the-mill, old-fashioned Bedford uh, near Lexington and Concord. Okay. Uh, oldest flag in the United States. That's wow. the trivia I know about our town. It has the oldest, 1729, I wow. believe. Wow, that is that's very early. It wow. is. We're very proud. We were really. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. That's great. So uh, you have wonderful piano chops. When did you start playing piano? Oh, uh, so I have a twin brother, and oh. my mom turned to both of us and wanted us to take lessons in something. So she turned to me at, when I was eight years old and said, "Okay, Bill, you're going to play piano." And she turned to my twin and said, "You're going to take tap dancing lessons." And of course, I kind of, being a kid, I taunted him a bit, like, ah, you have to tap dance. And now, of course, I would kill the tap dance. <laughs> and he would probably kill to play piano. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of both. But from eight years old till the end of high school, so about 10 years of lessons. Wow, wow that's fantastic. And when did you start singing? Mm, um, we did, uh, and again, my brother and I, we did, we did choir in high school. We did mad, we, there was choir and madrigal, and there was, in junior high too, we had, right? Yeah, we had choir then as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and did musicals, I think, about as early as, I think, the end of elementary school, so fifth and sixth grade. So pretty early, I guess, around 10 yeah. or 11, I hit the stage and started singing, I guess. That's great, that's great. So, so what would you consider to be your primary talent, comedy, acting, or music? Oh gosh. I mean, I, I, I love that I get to combine them with the, like with the, that song just now. I love that I get to combine comedy and music. I, I, and, and there were times that I would just do comedy. I did straight up stand-up comedy in my 20s and enjoyed it, still do it. But I, this I'm much more passionate about, about yeah. the combination of it. And the fact that I, I get to combine them is great. But yeah. I, I would say comedy. If I had to pick one, I would say comedy. because Okay. It's, so okay. And so how did you come to combine them? How did that idea come to you? Was it fate that kind of put you in that situation or was it a conscious decision to combine these things? I think, uh, so we had Tom Lehrer albums in our house growing up, yeah. which was a little weird because I remember one album and the weird thing is we didn't have a record player. <laughs> uh -uh. But eventually we did. We, did. we just had the record for some reason. Um, but Tom Lehrer was a satirist from the 50s and 60s who did combine comedy and music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was about it was about political references of the day. And of course, you know, I didn't get a lot of the reference. I didn't know who Hubert Humphrey was, um, but he would tell jokes about them. And I thought, 
oh, okay, you can do, you can combine the two in this way. And of course, Weird Al, I listened to Dr. Demento as a kid. Uh, so it was about that point that I, I wasn't necessarily doing it, but n was aware that you could, uh, or the ways you could combine them. That's and great. And didn't start combining them until my mid twenties, I would say. That's great. You know, it's so important what, what kids are exposed to, you know, oh, yeah. because that's something you heard and, and really had an opportunity to think about it and figure out how to put that into your own life, which is great since you yeah. have these wonderful skills. Um, so what was your first job as a performer, a paying, paying gig as a performer? I was Pluto at Walt Disney World. Oh, okay. So, so that was your, that was your first gig. That's great. That's great. So you were a character. You were one of the characters. We got to be, and they would put everything in like height ranges. So it wasn't just Pluto. I could be, uh, Tigger, Friar Tuck. I remember Mr. Smee from, uh, uh, and this is Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. And I stayed in Orlando for five years and wow. did that, did some something called Streamosphere, which was like a, an acting gig actually out at uh, Hollywood Studios where we were all dressed as um, Hollywood uh, stars and starlets from the 40s. And we would wow. greet guests as they came in. I did that for a few years and did improv at a theater called Sack Theater. Uh, and that's really when I started to combine the comedy and music because I would play music for the actors on the improv stage Oh. But also we would combine them in the songs as well. And so, uh, but no, Pluto, Pluto is my first. And those are some of the hardest working people, I'll tell you. In yeah. Time. Yeah. It's very hot in those costumes. I am sure. Hot. Yeah. So how did you get that gig? Where did you, you, did you audition in Massachusetts for it? Or were you already living in Orlando or how no, did that? My, my best friend in college at the time invited me. He's like, do you want to come to Orlando for the summer? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> And we auditioned, and I remember the audition was just doing just random steps. Like, okay, turn to the left, right, do this. Like, okay, you're in. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> Easiest audition. And I stayed there for the summer, but I just fell in love with Orlando and Disney World. And I did, again, stayed for five years. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that process was simple. I, I And I did character work there, I would say, for a year or two. I puppeteered for a while. Uh, they had a show called The Disney Crew which had like an anti-drug um, theme. We toured elementary schools. So it was great. It wasn't just being a character. You got to do all these other things as well. It was great. Yeah, that's great. And really gave you a rounded experience as a performer. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. So you performed on Comedy Central's Premium Blend. Very cool. What was that like? Wow, that was uh, 2000. So just over 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I had released my first album of, uh, it was called Bill's Family Fun Time, and it was made up songs about members of my family. Uh, and I had a song about my twin brother, actually, that I wrote. And someone saw me at uh, performing it live off, off Third Street in, in Hollywood. And uh, I got on the show and I performed it there. Very nerve wracking, of course, because I never, you know, performed at different venues, but never that kind of national spotlight. Uh, um, but no, they're very accommodating and the great audience and went well. And again, yeah, that was, it's crazy to think that was that long ago, but no, a, an amazing experience. Uh, my heart was pounding, but they couldn't tell. <laughs> but yeah. That's great. That's great. So tell us a little about your brother. Is he like in show business at all now, or has he made other choices for his life? He lives here now in Chicago, actually. He, uh, and he was uh, the performer of the family for a long time too, not just tap dancing, but a dramatic actor. Wow. Uh, he still does from time to time, but he actually works out here in Chicago, uh, working for the Metro actually. Oh, and cool. recently uh, moved out here. But yeah, we were both, that's what was wild. We were both performers, uh, again, in middle school, high school, we did the shows together. We we don't look that much alike. We, we're fraternal, so we look like brothers. We don't look like twins. Yeah. Um, if we did, we probably would have gotten away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's we, would have been, we would have gone that mischievous route, probably. Yeah, um, and why not? Huh? <laughs> we can, why not? Exactly. <laughs> that's right. So in 2013, you won the prestigious Jeff Award for Excellence in Chicago Theater for Best Actor in a Musical for Porchlight Music's Theater's Class Act. That must have been thrilling. What was, you know, what was that experience like? Um, well, I had done just a few productions here in Chicago and um, 
the the reason uh, I was able to be involved with the show was a, a woman named Becky Menzi, who is- Oh, I know Becky. You yeah. know her? She's a wonderful, yeah, oh. a wonderful lady, wonderful pianist, yeah. Because you had, when you introduced me, you had said Chicago legend, and I'm like, I don't know about that, but Becky Menzi truly is. She, uh, I, I, I met her at when the Gentry Piano Bar was open. I worked at the Howl at the Moon around the corner, would come visit her, and we we uh, began a friendship, and she invited me to audition. And the musical is the story of Ed Kleban, who is he was the lyricist for a chorus line, the musical a chorus line. Oh, okay. And it was his life story, and uh, he passed away at age forty-seven of cancer, and it's his trajectory. But it, the story is also about how he deals with anxiety and. Uh, when I heard about it, I jokingly said, "Oh, you want me to audition?" to be a nebbish, anxiety-written, balding songwriter. I'm like, where do I sign? <laughs> um, hilarious. But wasn't expecting, you know, the, uh, and it was a dramatic role as well, which I'd never done. I'd only done comedy and was kind of nervous in that respect. But uh, again, Porchlight Music Theater is an amazing organization, so supportive, an amazing cast, Stacey Flaster, an amazing director. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, wasn't expecting any, you know, the Jeff Award or anything like that. It was just the experience itself was astounding. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So as we were talking a little bit before we started Soundcheck today, and I was telling you that I've seen some of your clips on YouTube and they are very, very funny. Um, I loved the Chicago subway song. It is so funny and so true. <laughs> if you haven't heard Bill's work, Go to BillLarkin.com. Very, very funny stuff. You. Your website is beautiful and really great stuff on there, but it, just so funny, so clever, so clever. It's wonderful. Thank you. So I know that you've been a regular at the Green Mill in Chicago. Uh, what have been some of your other favorite places to perform in Chicago and beyond doing your, your comedy, music, singing thing? Let's see. Um, as we say, during the before times, I would perform, uh, I started to do the festival route and I had gone that way, uh, way back when I was in Orlando. Orlando's really well known for their Fringe Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done a few of those. I did Edinburgh, which is it, the Edinburgh Scotland Fringe, which is, I believe the hugest arts festival in the world. And you can get kind of lost in the shuffle there. And I did, but I knew that going in. So I said, I'm just gonna have the experience and it turned out to be astounding. Um, also um, a few venues in New York, uh, in LA where I lived for a little while. Uh, I'm slated to perform in Winnipeg when that rolls around again. We keep having to move the date, of course. Um, but yeah, any anywhere, uh, I love performing at cabarets, but I also love performing uh, at these French festivals because a lot of times there, you know, the audience, doesn't know what to expect. So they come in with a mindset of, okay, what do you have? And they're open to whatever it is, which is what that's I like great. about those festivals. Yeah, that's great. And then I'm sure they're delighted once they hear you. That's great. It's <laughs> great. I so not. I know that you were working a lot, as you've just said, uh, before the pandemic. Um, what was a typical day like you, for like you? No, what was a typical day like you, day like for you? Oh boy, what was a typical day like for you? before the lockdown, what what would a typical day have looked like? Hmm. Well, let's see. So here in Chicago, I, uh, you know, my regular job was at the piano bars. And so there is, I worked at Howl at the Moon, which is a dueling piano bar. There's one out here called Pete's Dueling Piano Bar in Rosemont. Uh, that's where I was working before this as long. Uh, also uh, the Redhead Piano Bar, which is pretty well known here in Chicago. Yes. Uh, and that's a solo bar where everybody, the traditional, you have the piano, everybody's sitting around you, singing along. Um, so that's what I was doing right before uh, hand. And and also performing at the Green Mill, they had a show, and I, I'm, I'm believing that the show will continue in the future called The Paper Machete, or a, a version of it, where every Saturday afternoon, almost like a fringe, all these different performers from Chicago, Second City performers, singers, uh, the entire mix, uh, would come in and perform on a Saturday afternoon for free. And the piece, place would be jam packed with performers. Um, so that would be my typical weekend would be perform there and then at one of the bars. And so that was my normal gig. That's great. That's great. 
So how have things changed for you during the pandemic? Now, you know, I know there's not been work, but you know, maybe what kinds of things have you been doing? Have you taken up any new hobbies or worked on any new projects or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, and we were talking to Jess, like I, uh, during this time, it's like, okay, well, what do you do? And I learned how to do, go the virtual route. I would do piano shows. Of course, it felt awkward at first because you don't have that audience. You're like, okay, well, as a, you know, you look in the, you look in the chat and see if people are having a good time and, you know, you gather it from that. But after the first few shows of that strangeness, I mean, you're grow, you adapt to it. Mm -hmm. And I'll just take a few shows where I just take requests as if I'm at a piano bar and other venues, uh, other shows, a lot on Zoom here where I'll do my own songs. And I do my own show on Twitch, which is a gaming platform a lot of musicians are trying to discover. Uh, and I do a show called Parody Song Improv, where people, and which I love because I get to combine the pop music that I learned with my old improv skills. And people just give me names of pop songs. And then we come up with a parody title for that pop song. And then I improvise what I think the parody song would sound like, what the, what the, lyric, you know, the chorus, the lyrics would all be. And I've been doing that since June, so 10 months of that. Wow, that's great. Now, how can people see that? Uh, that is on Twitch. It's actually twitch.tv. I don't believe it's twitch.com. Twitch.tv. And my channel is just my name with music, Bill Larkin Music. We're actually doing a show tonight, which is actually a benefit. Uh, all the proceeds will go to Immerman Angels, which is a Chicago-based uh, organization uh, helping uh, those with cancer and uh, amazing organization. There'll also be a show tomorrow where we give some of the proceeds to them as well. Uh, but I do it every weekend and I've been really enjoying it. That's great. Well, maybe Jess can put that in the chat or Henrique or somebody where people can, can come and join you. How much is it to uh, participate uh, with the fundraiser? Nothing. 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 So and, you, then, and then you just donate whatever you'd like to do. That's, that's it. You can donate whatever. And especially during this time, even during my own shows, it's like, if people can give, great. If not, I just appreciate the eyeballs. It's Absolutely. like, you know, and yeah, yeah they can Venmo or PayPal if they want to. But yeah, all those, all these virtual ones are free. So that's great. That's great. Well, we will encourage people to to do that. That's a good cause. And there's like, thanks so much, Jess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so what have you been doing to keep your spirits up during this time? Mm. Um. These shows definitely help, especially because the, you know, especially these comedy shows. Uh, I still write, I still write my share of songs. No, uh, there were a lot during the beginning of the pandemic. I remember writing one called Discovering My Apartment. <laughs> it was week two, I was like, week two of the, the, the um, lockdown. I'm like, oh, there's, there's a hook coming from my, the ceiling. <laughs> My apartment never noticed that before what does that mean what is that all about? so just a song about like you know you're discovering your four walls because you really have no choice um and a few other songs kind of pandemic related but after a while i was like i don't have the urge to write right now and i didn't berate myself i'm like okay yeah. do whatever you feel like doing so i've been doing these parody shows that's been fine obviously a creative experience as well um but having that connection having this connection has been the most important, I think. I mean, you go out, you do the things you need to do, but I'm thankful for Zoom. We still tried, it's funny, like those first few weeks of Zoom, like, what do we do? But now, of course, it's second nature. We're like, ah, yeah, do that, do that. Um, so this, any kind of relating to an audience, whether it's performing or just chatting, like we are doing now, has yeah. been the best thing about, you know, this time. Yeah, I found that to be true too, you know, just being able to connect with people and build community in, in a situation where you would have felt that there might not be an opportunity for building yeah. community. And Zoom has been a great um, source of that for everyone, in addition to business opportunities and all kinds of other opportunities. So it's great. It's yeah, great. Um, do you think that virtual performances will continue to be viable after the pandemic? I was talking to a lot of my musician friends who do virtual shows, we were just talking about that. Uh, we, we think so. We think a good share of it is here to stay. I think uh, in, the, you know, in the, the music field, especially what I do where I work at piano bars, you know, people want to be social again and they want to sing along and 
have a drink. And, it, and so that, of course, will never go away. The day we're able to do that safely, yeah. we'll be doing it. But since we're familiar with this uh, now, the virtual route, since we know how to do it and since we know how we can make it entertaining for the audience, because that took a lot of trial and error, of course, what works, what doesn't, you know. Absolutely. I think, uh, it, and I and I like that. I like that. And maybe it's because I'm my age too. I'm in my 50s now. And it's like, well, sometimes when I perform, I kind of feel it in my back. And I'm like, maybe I don't want to rock and roll at a bar. Maybe I'd like to do it from home. So I like that that's now an option. As far as how popular it'll be, I don't know. But yes, I do think a good share of it is here to stay. Good, good. And do you think that, you know, audiences will come out and support live entertainment like they did pre-pandemic? What do you think the world will look like for performers just in general um, after the pandemic? I know we're in this weird limbo where it's like, we don't, we don't really know. It's like each month we're like, okay, well, what's allowed now? And what is, you know, I feel like when we have the, you know, the open door and we can, you know, theaters can open again, my, my prediction. And of course my hope is that, yeah, uh, it, they'll not only be popular, but they'll be more, more so than they were before. Yeah. People will want that. People want that experience. They want that, the connection. They want everything about what live performance gives you. Um, and people have put it much more eloquent than me about, you know, what that does to your heart and what that does to, you know, uh, and, 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 every, and every single, you know, ex experience, whether it's comedy, music, opera, whatever. Um, but again, it's touch and go. It's this weird time where it's like, okay, well, what can we do? But since the door's opening a little bit, it's like, okay, since it's the summer here in Chicago and there, I mean, it's like, all right, I'll go outside, see a live performance outdoors, wear the mask, enjoy it. Great. I'll right. go that route. Um, but yeah, it will, I, I predict it'll be not just as big as, you know, as it was, but even more. So. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. People are so longing for that familiar feeling of being able to go into a theater, hear live music or to a jazz club or whatever, just to get back to some semblance of what life was like before the pandemic. So everyone's very anxious for that. I agree, I agree. So what advice would you give to actors, musicians or comedians as we seem to be nearing the end of the pandemic, how would you recommend that they prepare for the future? Hmm. Um, I remember during the first month or two of pandemic, and maybe you experienced this too, Dr. Pope, where it was like, I, I have to be creative. I, I have to be doing something right now. Uh, and of course, no, it's like, it was the same with like my writing. It's like, no, you, you take care of yourself first, which is, you know, from my mouth to, you know, like I need to take my own advice a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but I write about that too. It's like now when I write, it's very personal and it's like, well, you know, here's how you take care of yourself before you, you know, do anything else you need to do. But that is the most important thing. I think since we're redefining what, I don't want to say we're redefining what performance is, but how we perform, what we want to say, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to just follow that. Mm -hmm. Whatever it means to you, I think the best thing I learned, one of the best things I learned was don't write for your audience, write what affects you. Yes. Because I did that at a Second City show one time where I was writing something. And I was like, oh, I think the audience will like this. But afterward, I was like, nope, I, I, I just shouldn't have gone that route. I should, whatever I find funny, whatever I find meaningful, get that out there. And then you'll find your audience who feels the same way. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And that's right, you know, with, with singing or, or any kind of performing, you know, it's important to just sort of stand in your truth and be who you are. And that audience that can relate to what you're doing will find you. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm finding, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's great. So do you think that you've become more introspective? I mean, it certainly sounds as though you have, though I didn't know you before, but, but it sounds, you know, as though you've really given a lot of thought to, um, to what the pandemic has meant to us as humankind, you know, what benefits or what has it given to us uh, in terms of uh, just kind of recalibrating our lives and and you know thinking about things in a different way. Yeah, some uh, some have labeled it a reset, and mm -hmm. I do kind of like that. 
if you know depending on what you're resetting of course but like if you're uh you know i i would think i mean this is i'm sure the case for me where you you had no choice but to look back on what you were doing before what happened before what you experienced before and i don't know about necessarily correcting all those things but really taking it in and seeing seeing what's most important to you and then that's just it it's like when you are when you do go back out there it's like are you going to do what you were doing like if if you were enjoying let's say your nine to five job great but let's say you had one you didn't like and now after all this time it's like well did you think more about what you're most passionate about are you good i i'd like to think people you know have really whether they they change that, I don't know, but but have really mulled that over and really taken it in uh, yeah. because it is, does feel like a reset in that way. It's like you know, like we've had time to really process what it is we want to be doing, and of course the courage to do it is a whole other thing. But you know, the fact that we've been able to think about it more, I think, is beneficial. So yeah, I think so too. You know, I think you know before the pandemic, for all of our lives, I mean, we've just been running from one thing to another and racing and. The, you know, not really having the time to really stop and think. So this has given us an opportunity to stop, think, assess, redirect, all of those kinds of things. Yep. So it's great, it's great. Yeah. So we would love you to play another song for us if you would yeah. like to. What to do? What to do? What to do. <laughs> um. Well, I'll do. I'll do. Uh, I'll do the song I wrote for my twin brother. This is it. it, it um, I always preface it by saying, you know, it's. I say it's the first song I ever wrote. I wrote it. I wrote it for my twin. I wrote it for him when he was eight years old, and uh, at the time I was also eight. Mm -hmm. So that's just math. Very yeah, that's just math. How cool that you were writing at that early of a, of an age, though. I mean, oh, that's very cool. So skilled, even in second grade, Dr. Cole. I, was <laughs> I love it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I like to think it's heartfelt. I hope you feel it in your heart. So here we go. Uh, it's simply called You're My Twin, and here it is. Okay. You're my twin. You're my twin brother We've always been together Each day of our lives And now I must tell you My one and only twin When I was born mom and dad were so happy But then you came out too And they cried and cried Cause they only wanted one and you ruined all their dreams And we tried to leave you at the hospital But the doctors made us take you home Now we're miserable as hell And we wish you were not living with us And we thought of throwing you in the dumpster But of course we can't do that You're my twin My twin -y. 20 twin twin you haven't got a friend in the world and you smell like rotten meat you're also stupid my stupid rotten meat scented twin and you're the reason dad's always drinking and my mom is always drinking as well when you fall asleep tonight I will cover up your nose and mouth You will not be able to breathe And when morning comes you will be dead And then mom and dad will see your dead body And will laugh and laugh And be so darn happy Cause we'll finally have the family we wanted And the world will become a better place Everywhere we go will be rainbows and lollipops Everyone will get along with each other And because you're dead we'll all throw a party Everyone will be invited to the party and the people will all bring gifts to the party and the gifts will be for mom dad and me and you won't have any gifts for yourself that's because you will be dead my twin 
my twin brother. Mom and dad don't love you. Ooh, you're my twin. Loved it. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I appreciate that very much. And so now, so how does your twin respond to that? He has a great sense of humor, thank goodness. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, Bill, I want to thank you for being with us today. What a treat this has been. You are delightful. I'm happy to have met you. I hope to someday have an opportunity to meet you in person. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an honor. Thank you for having me. It's great to meet you too, albeit virtually. This is wonderful. And, and thank you for having me. Yes. Well, I'm going to sign up for your, e your email list, your I newsletter swear. list and stuff on your website. And I encourage everyone else to do that as well. You are, you are hilarious. Hilarious. Much, and talented. And talented. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to invite Jess back. She may have some questions or comments. Hey, Jess. I am just, I am just, you know, I think what I realized, Bill, while you're singing is like, what, what, when you make a comedic song, as an audience, you laugh and you feel naughty and you feel glad <laughs> that you're the one saying it. I'm like, I'm not naughty, even though I'm laughing, Bill's the one saying it, so I'm not in trouble. <laughs> like, you're just so, it's like a devious sense of humor. It just cracks me up. I don't know. Um, I did put into the chat the uh, Twitch stream. So oh, that's both for our Zoom audience and our Facebook audience. Right. Um, so for folks that are viewing, um, feel free to click on that link and put it in your bookmarks. Um, if you're looking at this on YouTube after the fact, uh, uh, just the reminder, it's twitch.tv forward slash Bill Larkin music. Um, so you can tune in there and and if you enjoyed the songs that he performed today and that's wet your palate for more, join him for some of his live streams. Um, okay. Bill, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I have so many things to say and so, you know, so I, how do I even top your song? Like, how do you even come back in and be like, so tell sure. me. Um, <laughs> Sean wants to know what years you were in Orlando. Oh, um, right after college, that's what was crazy. It was like, I got my college degree and then became Pluto and then never really used a degree. I still have it somewhere. Uh, 91 to 96, so five years. What was your, what was your degree in college? I have a degree in communications, which I guess I'm using now. Uh, if you think about yes. it, yep. yeah, I wanted to be a DJ when I was 19 and was like, and I really never went that route, but it all turned out for the best. So, uh, I, you know, it's funny because once upon a time I was auditioning somebody for something, uh, it was a, a commercial uh, for some sort of um, garbage disposal deodorizer and they had gone to school for acting. And, and it was like, it was basically the Friends TV show equivalent of smell the fart acting, where it was like, oh. you know what I mean? And in the middle of it, he's like, this is me using my degree right now. And that was like what I just thought of. It was like, you finished school and you're like, and I'm Pluto. <laughs> like, I went to school to become Pluto, you know? Um, but on sounds like the best gig. It's, I, I wrote in the chat while you guys were talking, it was like, that feels like work summer camp. Like, pretty young. Yeah. Pretty much just like, hanging out fun? with a bunch of other costume friends and, you know, the what hardest. was, what was not work hours? Like, maybe that's a question I have. What would y'all do when you weren't in costume or gigging? Oh gosh. Cause that was, what was weird. It's like, I never had worked more as a performer during that time. I, I did, which is insane to think about really. I was, would work at Disney world during the day and work at SAC theater at night, which is still at this prestige. That's where Wayne Brady got his start. And I performed with oh, him. Yeah. Uh, where uh, we would do just improv shows at night, sort of like whose line is it kind of games. And so my whole career was improv. After I did, ap after I was not Pluto, I did Streamosphere for years where well, was, I was saying where we did improv. So my whole career was improv for like three years. Wow. And looking back on that, I'm like, wow. And the fact that I made a living off and I'm like, this is neat. You yeah, know? valuable experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think when you're leaving school, you don't know what work normal is. You're like, I'm just, I got a gig and now I'm paying my bills. And then once you get distance from that, you look back, you're like, what a lucky son of a gun. <laughs> like, yeah. It became my normal, which was not, I didn't know what my intention was. I was just going from thing to thing. I was like, yeah, that was, yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, I also threw in the chat while we were talking, Kate, Kate messaged me, uh, Kate Johnson messaged me 
saying that Chris Jones has an article in the Tribune about the next arts problem having audiences trust vaccine. Ah. Um, and, and I've been having this conversation with other people like in arts administration um, about how do people fold in now in their arts program plan? How do you fold in the thought of what we think, you know, post pandemic future looks like? Right. Assuming that we all have met like the relative new normal, how do you program to meet that expectation? Yeah. Because the audiences that may have frequented the physical space may have a shift. I was, I mean, I was having this conversation with someone. I was like, I am a person that, yes, for theater, I would love to be there in person. And yet through this pandemic, I also acknowledge the fact that there's going to be plenty of people that don't get the vaccine. Right. There's going to be variants that we don't understand. Right. And so I still feel like I'm in a position that I do not understand the assumed risk of any public facing event, you know, space. Yeah. Um, how do you guys, and I'll pose this to Greta as well. How do you guys think, um, you know, arts programming is going to look in the future now that, I mean, both we're talking about reinvention of, you know, the form to meet the medium, you know, but now that the Pandora's box has been open, even in a world, you know, where public facing event spaces are, you know, reconvening, how do you think that that is going to shift the way people look at producing art or work mm -hmm. or programming or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that as you're looking out your window right now? I, I think that uh, I, I, I'm sure that arts programs or arts training programs are going to um, have a little bit more of an entrepreneurial bent to them uh, so that students that are learning to do whatever it is their arts discipline is might be looking at other related things that they could do. Because now that we've seen that there can be a pandemic, who knows, there could be another pandemic. And I was talking with one of my voice students who was also, she's primarily a dancer. And she was saying that very thing. She said she was really concerned now about her uh, career path, you know, but that uh, the place that she's studying, uh, they're, they're talking about other kinds of things uh, that artists can do and encouraging people to uh, think about their, all of their personal skills and interests. And, you know, how can you, use your uh, art skill uh, in maybe another way and incorporate some other aspects of your personality or your experience uh, to have that other kind of career to turn to if things don't go quite as you would expect them to with your art. Yeah. Bill, do you have any thoughts to add? You put it much more eloquently than I could put it. I have, uh, no, I, I think those first few months, a lot of us, I guess as performers, especially like, okay, money. I need to make money. Okay, what's it? And, and trying to combine it with what you do, with your, you know, with your art, like, okay, are you able to do that? And I am overwhelmed by like, how many of my friends have, were able to do just that, you know, uh, whether it be singing telegrams, I wrote songs for Mother's Day, I'll probably do it again next month. Like, anything to make what you do come out and especially because people need yeah as we can see like need art and entertainment more than ever during that time it's like okay well how do you present that to others the rest is like let me say like it's so weird that because it's so touch and go i can't even you know i can predict what what happens but i you know i would have no idea because you have to wait with like you say there may be a new variant there may be but we i think maybe after this last year we'll adapt to what happens in whatever way we've been able to do it thus far and and beyond but you're right it's like it's a wait and see thing which is frustrating but mm -hmm. you gotta do something yeah, but yeah there was there, there was one person i spoke to and they and they basically said though you know i got into this not to create virtual experiences but to have a bunch of people in the room together and have their hearts syncopate as they watch something that only the people in this room are seeing mm -hmm. she's like so as much as that is an option that's not what i got into this work for Right. And so, you know, it's that catch 22 of, yeah. of, on the one hand, now that the virtual is here, how do we accommodate the desire for that? And yeah. on the other hand, is it a poor man's version of what we set out to do in the first place? Because it's not really the thing, right? Mm -hmm. well, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, way for the arts to be even more viable. Because now, you know, we know what we used to do. And we can go back to doing that most likely. But we also now have this whole new um, frontier 
kind of, of things that we can do. I think it's kind of exciting. Yeah. A different toolbox, a different yeah. toolbox of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that like, we've also created this digital footprint of like uh, a supremely interesting moment in time. You know yeah. what I mean? Like this, the, the, the media that exists that documents this period Yes. You know, I really hope that people that are, 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 you know, way, way better at like uh, history and presentation and museum and all this stuff, like are figuring out how to synthesize all of the media into the presentation of this, because I yeah. can't fathom being a kid 40 years from now reading about this in a textbook and not having like a digital footprint example of what this, when you yeah. say Zoom, what, but what, Zoom, Zoom what, right? Like, yeah. you know, when, when the phrase uh, you're on mute becomes kind of like a cultural catchphrase, like why, <laughs> why is that, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. It's a lot of pandemic themed art, which is great, but I'll, maybe, maybe some of us now might think of it as overkill. I'm like, okay, am I going to see a piece about what's going on? But sure. I mean, if it's, you know, well, if we relate to it. You, you and I were talking a little bit before we started and I was saying that I've, I've kind of like wet my palate again for storytelling because I really, especially in this medium, I really appreciate the idea that we're all in the room watching a person tell something, but all eyes are on this one, this one Brady Bot brunch square of this person talking yeah. to just us right now. Yeah. So that's been an exciting thing for me. Um, and so I've been playing around with Second Story in Chicago, who's been doing a number of things and have like morphed their their you know presentation into the digital in a very lovely way um and they're talking about their next season and their theme is something along the lines of like off the map you know when you know life takes you off course and one of the things they said is but we're not interested in a bunch of pandemic art right now that's not the you know because everyone could write their like the pandemic story that blew me off the map like and i and i think that you know i i'm using my words now not theirs i think what we all don't want is to hear a bunch of people's pandemic stories coming out of it because we all lived it too, right? Right, right. right. <laughs> and, it's, and if the idea that like, you know, art and actors and creativity are what are getting us through this pandemic because it's an escape, the same reason that people went to the conventional brick and mortar movies, right? Mm -hmm. It's an, an escape from the world. You know, when we come out of this, we're like, oh my gosh, thank God we're out of this. The yeah. last thing I think everyone wants is, but can we talk about it again? You know, like, can I tell you a story about it? No, right. like we just came out of it, you yeah. know? So you know, it'll be I, interesting uh, to see if people, if people can successfully decide to incorporate pandemic art, like, you know what I mean? As far as the idea of what have they learned through this experience right. and how do they fold that into their creativity, you know? I was thinking about that last night. I was watching something, I don't even remember what it was on TV, but it was about the pandemic and all the people were wearing masks and, you know, and there were some um, hospital scenes where, you know, people were clearly suffering from COVID. And I thought, you know, I wonder if we'll ever see reruns of this, you know, if, if this will be something that once this time is over, we don't ever want to see again, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, because I'm sure there's like, uh, I'm sure there's like pandemic stories that if we heard them, they would, uh, they would blow us away. They would be like, <laughs> we'd hear it from an angle we never thought of. So I'd be open, you know, obviously open to it. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, as I try to write new songs, I'm like, well, what do I write about that? <laughs> yeah. Do I write about airline food again? What route do I go exactly? So it's like, but again, like I was saying to like Dr. Pop and I were saying, it's like, whatever you whatever you're connected to right now, just write that and don't, you know, I try not to worry in my head about whether it will connect with the audience or not. That's easier said than done because this brain is always doing that. But uh, I love that though, Bill. I think that's the best point because I think when you uh, externally agendize what you're trying to create, like the audience will blank, you know, or like- um, Agendize. <laughs> Isn't, right but like you know what I mean that like I think that's such a great point because what what if you're if you're catering to what you think is going to satisfy them then it's about them and not unique to you if you are giving them something they didn't know that they were looking for it's about you and it's going to surprise them so like right. to your point like the pandemic story that's supremely relative to your one unique experience not our giant shared experience mm -hmm. but your one story that be more intriguing than the large pandemic story because we all point we've all seen those scenes of people clearly in physical distress in the ICU without you know what I mean like that's the stuff that you know I mean to use the word that that people use that's triggering right like we don't need that yeah. you know but the story that's your your story that is that is the story you have to share that we wouldn't know yeah. to ask for because it's that's yours right. yeah yeah 
Yeah. Well, this was great. This was great. I, Bill, I adore sitting and talking with you. And I'm going to um, definitely, what time is your stream tonight? Your parody stream? Uh, tonight uh, is 8 p.m. All the proceeds, actually all the proceeds go to uh, Emerman Angel and they will be matched up to $100. I don't think I mentioned that. And tomorrow night is a show, uh, same, also parody, but that's late night. That's 11 p.m. Central. But tonight's is the overall benefit. That's great. Okay, so so for my own my own mental note for anyone listening, 8 p.m. Central tonight on Twitch. Um, feel free to throw a buck in the bucket. Um, and tomorrow at 11 p.m. Central. Bill, thank okay. you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Pope. Thank you. Thank Jeff. you, Bill. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And Jess, thank you. Take care. Yes, thank you, Greta. Greta, who do we have next week? That's a very good question. <laughs> I, See, I, 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 I prep you. you. I prep you. I, I, I set you up, right? Yes, um, yes. Yes. But we'll put it. We'll put it on on uh, the Facebook page. Yes. Check out our Facebook if you want to come back. Join us next Friday at this time, 11 a.m. Central. We'll be sitting down with yeah. another guest. And Greta, it's good to see you. I look forward to thank seeing you. you next week. Thank you. Great to see you both. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. You as well. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.